Hello, everybody. Welcome to this webinar brought to you by Bursa Malaysia and managed by LifeCham. So this is Shen Chu. I'll be the moderator for this Bursa webinar that is titled Semiconductor Materials Beyond the Silicon. All right. So how are you guys doing? So if you are doing all right and ready for the session, please type ready. Okay, let us know if you are ready for this. Okay, I think our speaker is also all geared uh, to share with you the, the amazing content today. And uh, as you know, uh, with a lot of advancement in technology, so uh, there will be some uh, breakthrough technology coming out in terms of materials that will be used in silicon as uh, silicon may have some limitations. So today uh, we will explore what are the what are the semiconductor materials that can go beyond silicon that can power the, uh, the frontier technology like 5G or EV. And today we're going to explore that. All right. So uh, it is a very technical session. Uh, so today you're going to pay attention and uh, we will do our best. Our speaker will do our best to deliver the best content to you so you can understand the future for semiconductor materials. So as usual, Disclaimer, whatever we share in this webinar is going, uh, is going to be on case study only. So for educational purpose, so in, uh, there's no any buy or sell recommendation in this webinar, even though we do, on a, we do some case studies. So there will be some case study, but it never construed for any investment advice. All right. So if you decide to make any investment decisions uh, after this webinar, you do it at your own risk. Okay. So allow me to briefly introduce our speaker today. And he asked me to keep his profile short. So uh, let me just keep it short. Huh? So an engineer by training, David began his career as an engineer in the telco industry for the past 10 years, uh, for 10 years, okay, before turning to his passion in value investing. So he served as a director in local activities, education and research firm for three years, managing research efforts and delivering advanced value investing and portfolio management education series. So David is now a full-time investor and dedicates his time and resources to nurture the youth in financial literacy. He is often invited to speak in broker seminars, webinars, as well as other Busa endorsed events. And his professional comments and opinions on value investing are featured in business publications like Focus Malaysia. David also provides consultation services in value investing and advanced portfolio strategies for high net worth individuals. So that is David background. So without further ado, let me bring forth you know, David to this session. David, how are you? Hi, Shane. Good evening. Can you hear All me right. proper? Yes. Can hear you loud and clear. Okay, that's great. Right. Okay. So let me uh, hand over the session to you. Yeah, thanks. Thanks. Yeah, thank you for I'm the great. colorful Another introduction plus... again. Yes. Okay. Can you see my slides now? Yeah, can see. Cool. Yeah. So um, again, once again, good evening, everyone. Uh, nice to be back here again. I understand from Shane that you know this is an extra sessions uh, 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 by Brusa. So uh, thank you very much for inviting me back. It's good to be back. And since this is a bonus uh, sessions, right? So you know, I told Shane that hey, I think we need to do some advanced topics. Huh? Otherwise, if we talk about all the usual topics right uh, your the audience uh, may get um, how to say bored right so um, that, that is why we, we thought or hey, actually we, we, we would like to talk something about more futuristic now um, and, and advanced um, so uh, I'm glad that you are with us tonight because this topic is going to set the tone of a lot of semiconductor investments moving forward um, so what we are sharing tonight is just barely scratching the surface. So bear with me, although it is a bit technical than usual. Um, but uh, I promise you, uh, all the materials uh, I will share tonight, um, they are actually uh, presented for, shared for a reason. In fact, for those of you who have followed us, uh, especially my, my, my topic since the beginning, since a couple of years ago, you notice that uh, we don't randomly pick topics to talk. Actually, we are trying to... Uh, with a, a investment, a long-term investment thesis, you know. And you know, as Power Thinker, um, technology and semiconductor has always been our core competency and we will always be, remain invested in this particular segment, although we may, you know, we may trade based on the market sentiment and, and the cyclicals, yeah. So coming back to tonight's topic, um, I'm sure, uh, pretty sure that not many people out there are talking about it. Uh, tonight, we're going to talk about semiconductor materials, and some, uh, I'm going to focus on something which is beyond the silicon. All right. Um, just for clarity, uh, this topic is not 
the objective is not to say that silicon will phase out. No, and in fact, silicon is here to stay. Uh, silicon will still be very relevant, important in a lot of electrical and electronics uh, applications. But uh, because of the advent of a lot of uh, advanced technologies, you know, like uh, electric vehicles, 5G, 6G, so on and so forth, right? It has very specific requirement for the um, semiconductor, right? Silicon, the, the role of silicon may slowly diminish uh, to make way for new materials. And that's why, that is the, that is the uh, objective, the principle of the uh, webinar session tonight. So again, uh, I'll break it down to a couple of topics. Uh, first, a little bit of introduction. Then I'm going to talk about uh, the semiconductor compounds. What are the upcoming trends? Uh, uh, focusing on power electronics. Okay, so we are focusing on power electronics. Then we move on to talk a little bit about soldering materials. All right, why it is so? Why this little thing is so essential in the uh, uh, advanced uh, uh, semiconductor? And then we're going to uh, move into a couple of case studies in KLSE. Yeah. All right. So without much further ado, let me just put my spotlight okay hope you can see my my spotlight let's move on now okay so let's go through a little bit of introduction now i'm sure um i hope you have followed the previous webinar uh, a couple of months ago uh, where we talk about you know um um uh, industrial electronics right so uh during the introduction i talked a little bit about um, why there is a chip shortage and a lot has it to do, a lot of it was actually attributed to this substrate called ABF, what we call Ajinomoto bulk film, right? So if you if you want to know a little bit more, or more about this, uh, do go, go to Live Champs YouTube channel to look for this video, yeah? But you see, um, substrate is just a semiconductor material, okay? In fact, uh, there are a lot of other semiconductor materials and and so before that, uh, because of that shortage of substrate, right? Sorry, uh, my, my storyline got a little bit jumbled jub up. Um, actually, in fact, a lot of companies are investing into uh, making their own substrate. This uh, latest uh, article by Wall Street Journal, all right, it, it highlighted that, you know, companies, giants like Intel, uh, Nvidia, uh, AMD, so on and so forth, right? They cannot wait. For, because they don't want to find themselves in another uh, shortage uh, situation like what they are facing now. Uh, they actually push lead time to for a few weeks to a uh, few months, right? So they, in order to mitigate this risk, they are investing in their own capacity to, to make uh, substrates. You know, this little thing is nobody want to do substrate because the margin is so thin before, okay? But, uh, and, and, and therefore there was, Again, like there was an underinvestment in this particular um, production, uh, this manufacturing. That is why it leads to it has led to this uh, shortage situation right now. As you can see from here, based on their own estimates for you know advanced chip substrates, right? You see, because the capacity has not grown uh, or uh, in the past few years, that's why with the advent of all these new technologies coming out, which drives demand for advanced chips, right? The, the, the semi, this material uh, cannot catch up to the demand. That is why we believe that certain substrates for this advanced chip is going to be more and more expensive. And that is why the ASP for certain chips will only start to go, uh, will only continue to grow, yeah? And, and, and as I mentioned before, actually substrate is just a part of the semiconductor materials. Now in the high level semiconductor supply chain, as you can see in front of you, um, so basically this is a very, very high level, very simplified model of how a chip, uh, the, the process of a chip production. So for R&D to design fabrication, which is the wafer, all the way to packaging, uh, testing uh, and assembly to the end user, right? Now, as you can see here, actually um, the inputs to this chip production process right it depends on which pro which stage are you at for example during the design we have things like eda the electronic design automation software the core ip design so on and so forth which you input into the design of the uh, wafer of, of the semiconductor chips then you need to fabricate it on the wafer and that is where our equipment as well as materials will come into play. Now, not only that after this stage, actually during the packaging as well, as well as the assembly, materials also play a part. And that is why material, semiconductor materials are very important for during the fabrication, uh, the wafer fabrication, as well as the uh, packaging process, okay? So in terms of semiconductor materials, we and that is why we can 
roughly uh, uh, split into two categories. Uh, one is the materials for fabrication and the other is the materials for packaging. Yeah. Now, um, so for fabrication, as you know, the main materials is usually silicon, you know, chemicals, photo mask, photo resist, uh, gases, you know, so on and so forth, as well as a lot of other materials. And these are spe specific materials. Most of them are chemicals, all right, to actually, which are used for the production of the wafers. Now, after the wafer is produced, it passes on to the next process where, you know, all set players like, you know, uh, Inari, uh, uh, which is homegrown, you know, they, they'll, they'll be actually dicing. I mean, they'll, they'll, they'll dice or they'll split the, the, the wafer apart into small small chips or what we call dice. And in the process, they'll, they'll also use a lot of materials like substrates, as I mentioned before, uh, frames, uh, ceramic materials, bonding wires, or now uh, later on, I will share uh, more about uh, more and more people are using bumps right now or the what we call the solder balls, uh, re resins, that attached materials, and so on and so forth. Now, in terms of value, uh, because there's more value at, you know, the, the thing about semiconductor process is the the further you go into the to the production chain, right? There's more value added. That's why more materials are needed. So in terms of value, actually, uh, packaging the packaging processes will re will require more semiconductor materials than the fabrication processes. Okay. So this is a very uh, high level introduction of uh, what are the main categories of semiconductor materials. Now, uh, as I mentioned before, uh, as I mentioned just now, um, the semiconductor material the demand for semiconductor material is going to grow, especially after the pandemic. Um, so this is the latest by semi, uh, uh, semi uh, this uh, uh, research, um, uh, sorry, this re research body, uh, which specialize, which focus on semiconductor, right? They actually foresee that uh, in 2021, 2022 and beyond, right? Actually the demand for semiconductor materials for both wafer fat and packaging materials is going to grow, right? Now you can calculate the KGA, but uh, even for next year, right? I think uh, they estimate they just estimated that they'll need at least a hundred billion uh, 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 dollars of, of of these semiconductor materials, which is needed to to be produced. Now, in terms of the geography, the uh, the geographical distribution. Um, of course, countries like Africa, South America, they are not semiconductor players. So naturally, they are, they are, the demand for these semiconductor materials will be very low. All right. Then you may, you may be wondering, hey, how come advanced countries like, you know, the European country, like UK, uh, Germany, or even US, right? How come they are not the highest usage? Uh, they are not countries the highest usage, right? Now, this is because they do not use, they produce a lot, all right? The countries or the continent that uses a lot of these materials are where the companies, the OSEC companies, like, like um, this SPO, uh, uh, JSET, uh, you know, uh, uh, MCOR, uh, Inari, so on and so forth, they are uh, where they are situated or even in China, right? So Asia, as well as uh, Asia Pacific is the continent where a lot, of this, a lot of these semiconductor materials will be landed on and be used to, to, be, tran um, to be transferred, sorry, to be used into, into packaging into uh, semiconductor chips. Now, who are the main players uh, or who are the main suppliers of these semiconductor materials? Uh, they, are, they include all these international names like BASF. BASF uh, this is from, this is the largest chemical company uh, from Germany. Uh, we've got LG Chem from Korea, Indium Corporation from US, Hitachi from uh, uh, Hitachi and Kyocera from Japan, Henkel from Germany, Sumitomo from uh, this uh, uh, Japan, so on and so forth, right? But these are mainly chemical companies, and of course, you know the the chemicals or the materials that they they they, they manufacture are used across different types of industries, not just semiconductor. Yeah, and and this list is this list is not exhaustive. Now, one of the companies that I uh, I feel is of interest is this company called Henkel AG. Recently, they have been quite active in this space, although they are not the top players, um, uh, but they are quite um um how to say focused on electrical and as well as electronics uh, uh, materials and uh, chemicals. Yeah, so if you want to do more research, you can dig deep in dig deeper into this company. All right now, uh, so that's a little bit of introduction about semiconductor materials. Remember, there are basically two categories. One is the semiconductor materials for fabrication processes. The other one is for uh, packaging. Now, in the interest or in the context of Bursa Malaysia company, uh, companies listed on Bursa Malaysia, right? 
Um, unfortunately, we do not have a lot of, uh, we do not have any, or we do not have many companies that are involved in the semiconductor materials for wafer fabrication processes. On the other hand, we do have a few good companies that are involved in the supply chain, in the material supply chain for uh, uh, materials for uh, packaging. Yeah. And that is why I want to focus more on the packaging side. Um, and, and, and in that regard, um, there is actually a lot of interest in power electronics. Yeah. So that is why I want, I want, to, do, I want to talk about this uh, topic here. All right. Now, but before that, uh, I've got to apologize. So I'm going to bring you guys back to, you know, for your high school or even your university, uh, especially for those of you who are from the science stream, right? I'm sure you have seen this table before, right? <laughs> yeah. So don't worry, don't worry. We are not going to go back to chemical cl chemistry class. Basically, this is just a periodic table of elements, right? And, and we are looking at this from a semiconductor point of view, all right? Now, I'm sure you, you, sh you should remember at least a couple of you know, uh, elements like hydrogen, uh, boron, uh, aluminum, silicon, phosphorus, right? So these are the different types of metals uh, which is appearing in, in nature, right? Um, but we are not going to go, we are not interested in all of it. In fact, we're only interested in a very specific group of uh, metals. Uh, so the, we loosely call them um, uh, group two, three, four, five, and six, depending on how many electrons which is on the outer shell. So group two means there are two electrons on the outer shell, three means there are three electrons, so on and so forth. Okay, now uh, why are these um, 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 uh, important in our, our for our interest? Uh, because I want to introduce to you what is the difference of what is the meaning of semiconductor. Okay, now we all know that metal conducts heat, metal conducts electricity, right? And 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 why is that so? You know, why does metal conduct right? Is, actually, if you look at it, it's because metal allows the electrons to flow through the uh, the, uh, the I mean the, the material so can you imagine that any metals there are basically there are two types of bands are so you got to you know imagine there are two invisible bands what one is called a valence band and conduction band now in order for electricity to pass through um, the material the electrons need to need to jump or pass through from this valence band to conduction band. And in order for them to do that, they had to bypass this physical limit or physical level called Fermi energy. Fermi energy, it, loosely in layman's term, is like uh, 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 the level, the energy level to allow one electron to pass through at zero Kelvin. That's it, basically to conduct electricity. Now, on the other hand, all right, so sorry, before that, you can see that actually in metals, right, the, these two bands, that overlap each other. That is why it is very easy for these electrons to pass through. On the other hand, when we have insulators like organic materials, right, or wood or, or you know, certain type of metals, uh, 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 these metals or gases, right, the, the, the distance between this uh, conduction and valence band are too huge. And the distance, this difference is called band gap, and which uh, a term that I will use a bit more later, all right, uh, is so big that actually the electrons cannot jump from one band to the other, all right? That is why they're called insulators. So which means that any electricity that pass through, you'll be insulated, all right? Okay, like rubber, for example. Now, in between these two extremes, right, there exists something called semiconductor. It is a material that can allow, can semi allow the electrons to pass through. Now, not as easy as metals, but they do not also block the electrons entirely. And this is what's what we call semiconductor. Okay. Um, and semiconductor, there are many different types of materials or all of us, we know about silicon, right? So silicon is uh, what we call the first generation type of um, um, semiconductor material. It is simple, it is easy to manufacture, right? But it is also has its limitations. Then of course, along the way, we've got second generation, but tonight I want to talk a little bit more about third generation. Now, why third generation is, uh, is, is of uh, interest here is because third generation um, um, semiconductor materials or compounds like your silicon carbide, gallium nitrate, even your uh, this uh, uh, zinc uh, silicate, zinc selenium, right? They have, a, they have a 
relatively bigger band gate than the first and second generation semiconductors. And because of these very special feature uh, characteristics, they are, they are more suitable for certain uh, applications, which especially in the uh, electro uh, sorry in the power electronics segment yeah so so just remember uh, third generation uh, electro uh, semiconductor materials or compounds they have a wider band gate or what we call wide band gate and of specific okay this is just a you know a few examples of uh, different groups of semiconductor uh, sorry semiconductor compounds now now you know why I color code right for example zinc uh, zinc silicate is actually from group two and six two six uh, zinc is from two six uh, sorry this uh, 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 sulfur is from uh, group six right that's why when you, when you combine together to create a compound called zinc uh, sulfide all right zinc selenium so on and so forth now in fact there is one American company called two six you know, um, the reason why they call themselves two is because they specialize in this particular group of semiconductor materials. We can look about it. I, in fact, I heard that they are expanding. Uh, they are actually uh, um, constructing a huge plant in Penang. Uh, okay. So you can, uh, I feel very proud to be in Malaysia because lately because of China trade, US China trade wars so and so forth, a lot of these international companies are moving, are coming to our Asian Silicon Valley, which is in Penang, right? To, to actually set up their manufacturing plant. So coming back to here, um, what well, now you, you understand uh, depending on how the semiconductor compounds are, are being uh, produced, right? Whether uh, they are from different groups, all right? They can even uh, come from the same group of uh, uh, 4,4, all right? Which is uh, where we have things like silicon carbide, silicon germanium, uh, so on and so forth, and many more, right? This is just a, a sample of uh, how many how semiconductor compounds can be produced by mixing together, okay? Now, of particular interest for power semiconductors is this thing called the semi, uh, SIC or silicon carbide as well as GAN or gallium nitride, all right? All right, um, so well, after this, I'm going to talk a bit more about why these are uh, so uh, interesting, yeah? Now, um, but before that, let's talk a little bit more about power semiconductor. What are power semiconductors, right? Or power electronics. Now, power semiconductors are, are just like any other regular semiconductors, but they, they have a very specific function. Now, most of them, I would say majority of the power semiconductors are used for switching. Now, in layman's term, switching is like on off, right? Of course, it's not as simple as that. Uh, you can actually do a lot of things, a lot of signal um, um, uh, manipulation or you know, how we can actually control a lot of circuits by this switching function, all right? Uh, most of the power semiconductors uh, require high performance. Um, they need to be able to withstand very high uh, temperature. They need to be able to operate at very high frequencies, especially for modern, um, techno uh, modern uh, equipment. Um, they also need to be able to uh, withstand or pass through high currents, you know. Um, and, and power semiconductors come in many different forms. It can be discrete like this. Uh, that's why we call, this is what we call discrete semiconductor. They are very simple, all right. Um, most of, I think most of you who have seen uh, uh, any of this uh, um, uh, somewhere, all right. If you, if you, if you, if you are adventurous like me, so as when I was a kid, I used to take a screwdriver, open out the radio and TV, and then my father would scold me. But this is um, curiosity kills the cat. Yeah. Yeah. So we got things, very simple things like, you know, discrete semiconductors all the way to more, more complex um, uh, modules. This is what we call modules, or even uh, uh, this uh, uh, the, another the entire system. Yeah, and uh, these I think these are called IGBTs. There are many different types of some power semiconductors. All right, to even these are uh, power supplies here. Okay, now as I mentioned before, these power semiconductors are typically used as switching devices as well as rectifier. Now rectifier means um, you know sometimes um, most of the power are, which are generated are in alternating current AC, right? So it's like a sinusoid wave. So sometimes you just want to uh, want to convert it to DC, a direct current. So you need uh, you know uh, 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 equipment like a rectifier, all right, to to actually cut. I mean to to convert AC to this to DC. We can also use uh, rectifiers to step up or step down. You know the voltages and so on and so forth. There are so many uses. Okay, now the interesting thing about power semiconductor is uh, um, a lot of things, a lot of people, they misunderstood. 
they thought that power semiconductors, especially the advanced one, will require very advanced nodes, you know, like all this, uh, <laughs> this uh, race towards uh, how, how small your nodes can get, right? Like I think the latest one was five nanometer, right? Uh, which is uh, 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 championed by TSMC, but Samsung also came out to say that they can do it. But power semiconductors do not require these advanced nodes. In fact, old nodes, like even less than 200 millimeters, right? is already enough, all right? Uh, for, for most of, the, or if not all the power semiconductors that we require, okay? Um, uh, so what are the disadvantages, uh, especially older materials, all right? Uh, power semiconductors, because of the nature of the function, right? They are very susceptible to overheating issues uh, as well as a high, uh, you know, um, how to say, wear and tear uh, because of these high voltages as well as uh, current or even uh, uh, frequent switching, right? So that's why we need more advanced materials, okay? So, um, very simply said, there are a couple of categories of power semiconductor that at least you should know if you're interested to invest in this particular category of semiconductor, yeah? So um, the most um, common one is called the MOSFET. MOSFET stands for metal oxide, uh, uh, metal oxide uh, field effect transistor. Um, basically, this is, uh, you know, coming back to, to, to here, so these are the, the Metal is can be any type of metals here, right? So these are the these are the more older technology, right? Um, metal MOSFET. Uh, there are many types of MOS or metal semiconductor metal oxide semiconductors. Uh, they can be CMOS. They can have uh, different types of MOS as well. But um, as a power semiconductor, right? Uh, they are fully controllable. Uh, they can handle large amount of power. But the problem is they um, cannot. Uh, be used in very high frequency uh, applications, for example, all right, or even uh, low, very low voltages and uh, application. That is why we've got this thing called IGBT or what we call insulated gate bipolar transistors. Uh, it is also as like the power MOSFET, they are fully controllable um, and they are often used for low to medium frequency applications, all right? Like power MOSFET, they have high impedance gate, so they require very little power. They all, some, some of the IGBTs do not even require any current to operate the, the switch, right? Okay, but uh, IGBTs, um, uh, because of the high power ratings and low on-stage voltages, they are used for low power, like your IOTs, you know, your air conditioning, or even certain modules in the EVs that do not require uh, very high voltage inputs, you know, like a lot of these uh, gas systems, uh, uh, or, or sensors, right? So a lot, require a lot of IGBTs. Now, on the other hand, we've got this thing called tri, tri, uh, thyristors. Thyristors are semi-controllable power switches. Um, they have another name called SCR uh, or silicon control rectifier. So as you know, the name rectifier, right? As I uh, explained just now, they are uh, they can convert, you know, uh, the L, the electrical current direction, whether it's unidirectional, bidirectional, so on and so forth, right? And uh, thyristors are mostly used for power supplies, uh, for home appliances, uh, uh, for protection, you know, uh, so on and so forth. Now, then the other categories is what we call the power rectifiers. Again, like I mentioned, they are basically like a diode. Uh, they, they, you know, diode means what? At a certain level of voltages, they just switch off. So it cut off, all right? So it's very good for rectifying your, your signals or your, or your power, right? Uh, uh, different categories of power semiconductor uh, uh, that we should at least know. Of course, there are many others, um, but for the interest of tonight, basically, we just need to know about this few because uh, of the applications that uh, interest us, uh, like EVs or even uh, the 5G communication equipment, right? They require uh, a flavor, a few flavors of these power semiconductors. <clears throat> Excuse me. All right. Now, Moving on with more advanced, uh, uh, with, 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 with the advent of uh, new technologies like 5G communications where we have, you know, uh, we, we need to, um, the demand for higher frequency, higher speed is getting more and more, right? In fact, 5G is not really a, in my opinion, uh, it's not, it's nothing fantastic if not for the millimeter wave. And we know that millimeter wave requires more than six gigahertz of operating frequency, all the way to 30 gigahertz and even more, all right? And that is why um, a lot of these uh, 
um, present or traditional semiconductor materials, like your MOS, as I mentioned before, right? They are not suitable for these applications. Now, don't get me wrong. Um, silicon is still very much relevant in our, our world as uh, in technology, but for certain specific for specific uh, applications uh, that require either very high power or very high frequency, they may not fit the mold. Okay. Now, one such thing, one such material is called LD MOS or what we call lattice diffuse MOS, uh, metals oxide semiconductor. They are they are the de facto power uh, material for power management modules previously for two G, three G, or even four G. But as we move to five G and beyond, right? And talking about 6G already, right? Where we need to operate when the where the equipment need to operate at very high frequencies, you see um they are their their performance that will actually they are at their their rating, huh? All right, will not allow them to op operate at that kind of, of, of frequency. Now, now we've got the first generation or second generation materials like gallium uh uh, uh arsenide, where you know these materials will saturate the power will saturate above certain level, which means that. Um, if you have an amplifier or you have a power switch that, that is, uh, that is uh, based on uh, this uh, material, um, at this level of power, no matter how much power pump in, it will saturate, meaning the, the amplifier or the equipment, the, the semiconductor will not pump more, output more power. And that is why we require more advanced materials like the GAN, uh, gallium nitrate or silicon carbide. All right. Now, um, silicon, as you can see here, because of the need for speed and need for higher power or what we call power density, right? Uh, that's why we need high uh, wide band, gate, band gaps, uh, compounds like these uh, uh, two materials mentioned here. Now, SIC is sick, provides excellent mechanical, chemical, and thermal properties, uh, which means that they are less susceptible to corrosion, uh, chemical corrosion or wear and tear because of the high temperature or high operating temperature, or they are more, uh, they're more tougher, they're harder uh, to withstand this uh, wear and tear from mechanical, um, you know, uh, sorry, mechanical wear and tear. Um, then on the other hand, GAN uh, has uh, very good electrical properties, uh, which is uh, um, more suitable for high speed, high frequency applications. That is why a lot of our 5G communication components, right? Uh, or even charges, right? We actually use a lot of GAN uh, uh, materials, whereas for SIC, it's more for this uh, high power, high speed uh, power uh, um, semiconductor, which is used in uh, rail transports, uh, you know, smart grids, uh, ships, so on and so forth. But there is a space in between these two, whereby you know, it's not, we don't really require very high voltages, but um, not low as well. And there is um, uh, they can withstand uh, this uh, high thermal uh, coro uh, sorry wear and tear as well as high mechanical wear and tear. Is this 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 space is what we is suitable for? You know, a compound like GAN over or sorry, GAN on SIG or GAN on uh, silicon. Uh, and these, uh, these materials, these compounds are widely used in technologies today, like, you know, PV, you know, the photovoltaic inverters, uh, EVs, uh, the battery chargers, uh, and, and the distribution systems, uh, power, ma power management modules, uh, power ICs, 5G base stations, uh, controls of the motors, uh, power supplies, so on and so forth. And this is the sweet spot. All right, and that is why uh, these uh, third generation uh, white band gate compounds like gallium nitrate as well as silicon carbide uh, is getting will get more and more important. As we know, uh, renewable energy, you know, uh, I mentioned in a in my previous webinar, in the world of renewable energy, uh, photovoltaic is the most used because of the availability of sunlight, and 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 you know, in 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 the uh, um. This uh, sorry in the evolution of our transportation system, where more and more EV cars will be will be on the road in the next couple of decades, right? That is why this particular segment is of interest to us. Okay, now um, of course there are challenges. Um, of course I only talk about the good things. Now there are also uh, a lot of headaches for those who want to produce uh, silicon carbide, especially uh, same thing for the gallium nitrate as well. Now because of the properties or the endurance against all this. Um, all this uh, wear and tear and corrosion, whether it's chemical, mechanical, or thermal, right? Uh, the materials are very hard, and that's why it is very hard to produce. Okay, uh, for example, uh, 
um, you know, it takes about three days from the research that I read, it takes about three days to produce a 200 cm length of uh, 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 silicon uh, material to be used to produce the wafer, right? But for silicon carbide, uh, one week they can only produce a two to five cm of uh, bull. Now, you know what is a bull? Now, if, if you can follow my, my cursor here, this is like a bull, all right? B O U L E. Uh, for those of you who like to bake, you know, who like to make your own bread or your own cakes, uh, you know that you know you have to you have to use flour and water and eggs, right? To mix to, to form into a bowl. Then you, you wrap it up for you know the, the yeast to work itself, right? Now that bowl is also called a bowl. So in semicon in, in the production of semiconductor uh, materials. All right, this is also called a bull. All right, now because of the uh, characteristic, right, as you can see here, the silicon carbide is actually three, between three to five times stronger, harder than the typical silicon. Now, for reference, diamond is about uh, 10,000 uh, kilogram per millimeter squared. All right, 10,000, so this is very hard, but silicon carbide is, is actually uh, three to four times harder than the silicon, all right? In terms of the fracture strength, right? It, you see, silicon carbide is as tough as the diamond. Uh, this means that we need as much um, the tensile uh, strength. Uh, uh, the same tensile strength is required to fracture the uh, material. As you can see here, silicon is very soft in layman's term, whereas silicon carbide is as tough as the diamond. And that pr presents a lot of challenges for, for the producers of this silicon carbide as well as GAN and other um, third generation semiconductor compounds, right? Uh, so, and, and this process is not just on the, on the material, all right? It is it's all the way in the, in the supply chain from uh, wafer fabrication to slicing, dicing, to the epitaxy uh, formation, all right? To, uh, uh, to packaging. And that is why this presents a lot of challenges as well as opportunities for technology and even semiconductor players, you know, like especially in the packaging side. Lah. You know, because, you know, with more problems, then you need more advanced uh, machines, you need more advanced packaging uh, processes, right? That's how you make money. And, 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 and also because uh, of, as I mentioned before, the new um, advanced applications in 5G EVs, right, will require this, um, particular semiconductor compounds that is drive the demand for it. And I think hopefully you guys can follow the story why I, why I present this, uh, why I present the, 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 the webinar in, in this manner, yeah? Okay, so challenges aside, uh, um, um, they are, um, the company that dominates this uh, silicon carbide, it's actually this company called Cree, uh, C-R-E-E. Uh, they are US-based. Uh, a couple of years ago, they... They've decided because Cree traditionally was an LED uh, supplier, so they are very good in producing LEDs. Um, but a couple of years ago, they decided it, they, they saw an opportunity in power semiconductor. That's why they acquired this company called Wolf Speed. Now, Wolf Speed um, is specializing in silicon carbide as well as gallium nitrate. And since then, they have actually dominated the market. As far as silicon carbide is concerned, for what I read, um, Cree actually um, uh, uh, commands 60% of the market of silicon carbide. And the best thing is, we have a couple of companies in Malaysia that supply to Cree. Yeah. So you understand why I mentioned this now. Yeah. So now uh, moving forward. Um, so this is just, that's why I say it's just touching the surface. Uh, I try not to be too technical, but at least I still need to introduce certain uh, technical aspect of. Uh, to you guys for so that you can understand. We move on to this uh, another material, uh, uh, not the semiconductor material, but more about the uh, other packaging materials. And this is called the soldering. Now soldering, uh, when I was a kid, I used to play with the solder gun by my dad. I burned myself, I burned my finger, I burned my leg because uh, I, I accidentally touched the solder gun. But I don't know if you remember, uh, when you solder something, right, you need to have another wire. Actually, it's made from lead, yeah? Plumbum, or call it, right, in Bahasa Melayu, uh, but it's basically lead. But it's not pure lead. Actually, this is a, a big a compound of lead and tin as well as other materials. So you can you have to solder your components onto the PCB, so on and so forth, right? And, and actually, it's basically the same thing when it comes to chips as well. It's just that it is done in a much, much more minute scale. Okay, and you can see that um, 
actually this semi this alloy uh, sorry this soldering materials although they are not very high tech but they are absolutely essential all right in when it comes to packaging now we know that packaging technologies has also advanced along the years you know, from your very simple um uh you know dip uh, dip or qfp packaging right we've now moved into flip chips we now move into uh 2d 3d uh, fan in, fan out, WLP, right? Uh, uh, so on and so forth. And this packaging technology is only going to be more and more advanced. All right. Without going too much into technical details, I just want to show you guys. Uh, basically, uh, by the way, this is a, uh, a slide from KLA 10 Core. Uh, so maybe I just zoom in a little bit for you guys here. Okay. Now, as you can see here, maybe this one. Look, look at these RI packages. Now, in the previous, in the olden days where they do this uh, BGA chips, BGA uh, ball grid area, um, you can see this part here is a die. So basically, die is the is is you know the output from the wafer where you cut, you know, and then it's a very small piece. You put it on a package. This is the die will sit on top of the package. Now, how you connect the die? In, into the uh, uh, board, this uh, grid, board grid array, is actually using this, what we call the wire, uh, about wire bonds. Now, normally these wire bonds are either made from gold threads, made from uh, copper, so on, uh, silver, so on and so forth, right? Many, many materials, right? But you can see here, it's, this, this design is not, uh, how to say, uh, efficient, right? Because, you know, you need to have, you know, to have a wire inside a package, right? It, to me, doesn't make sense. And that is why in more advanced uh, technologies of packaging, right? You can see that the actually wire bonds are getting less and less. But what's getting more and more are uh, these sold soldering balls or what we call solder balls, okay? Uh, there are many companies out there that produces these materials for these solder balls. Uh, one of them is this Taiwan company called Acurus, recently acquired by MI Technovation, right? Uh, don't underestimate <laughs> these uh, solder balls. They are absolutely important. And uh, although they are very tiny, uh, they are, a lot of research is actually being done uh, to, to figure out what are the best materials, you know, what are the best alloys to be used to, be, to, be used to produce these solder balls in order to have the type of characteristics required in advanced packaging. Okay. Um, as you can see here, uh, this is a slide from SMIC. As you can see that um, solder balls used to be quite big. <laughs> now they're getting smaller and smaller, even tinier or thinner than our strand of hair, uh, as small as 10 microns. Uh, uh, and and the, these days, actually, the solder balls are not just um, simple uh, lead or tin. Actually, they have a lot of other materials like the um, copper. That a lot of them are actually encapsulated with copper you know for uh, to enhance the enhance the characteristics for conductivity as well as insulation um, as you can see here just like I mentioned I think this is just a different uh, um, presentation uh, as packaging technologies become more and more advanced where we have 3d uh, heterogeneous integration monolithic IC so on and so forth the demand or the um, role of this um, um, so the boss is going to be more and more important, right? Uh, just let just let me give you an example here. Uh, let me zoom in a little bit here for you to see. Now imagine, you know, in a two D typical um, uh, packaging where you need to have two different types of chips or, or uh, uh, modules. Uh, sorry, this uh, uh, semiconductor to power up something, right? So 2D, so basically you go X and Y, right? But imagine, and, and you can see that this, there's a problem here, it takes a lot of space. And as our devices, as our equipment becomes smaller and smaller, we need to be more innovative in order for us to reduce the size of our devices. And that's why they came up with this 3D stacking, you know, uh, 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 3D uh, packaging technology, where instead of stacking your, the, the chips laterally uh, on, on a two-plane surface, we're just stacking on top of each, each other. Now, of course, when you stack on top of each other, they need to communicate the, between, between these two layers. So we've got these solder balls to, 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 to do it, all right? So as you can see here, uh, these are the different substrates uh, or the epoxy, all right, in between these uh, um, uh, dyes as well as uh, different components of the, of the chip. And then, and this will be actually, um, 
glued or attached to the PCB. All right. Again, for each layer, you see different usage of solder balls. And solder balls come in different forms, come in different sizes, come in different materials, come in different ratings. All right. That's why I say do not underestimate these solder balls. They are absolutely important. One little defect here is allowed, I mean, is enough to, to cause uh, 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 undesirable um, uh, impact to the electronic device. Uh, imagine if it's used in uh, um, applications like automotive, right? This is absolutely uh, uh, crucial that we make sure that there is no defect here. And that is why so, so the balls are so important. Okay, now, so just that, that's just a little bit about the solder balls. I promise Shane that I will leave more time for Q&A later as well as case studies. That's why I, I, I do not want to be too long-winded in the uh, introduction as well as you know, the um, uh, storytelling part. Uh. So I'm going to move on to the next uh, final topic for tonight, which is the case studies uh, in KLSE. As you can see here, I show you already what I'm going to talk about. So basically, three stocks today listed on KLSE. Uh, they are MPI, Pentamasters, and, and, and MI. Now, I'm sure a lot of you are wondering, now, hey, how come I always talk about the same stocks? Huh? How come there's no more interesting things, man? <laughs> yeah, actually, there's a reason. As I mentioned before, um, for us here, myself as Spiral Thinker, right, we do not simply pick you know, topics to talk about. Actually, we are what we're trying to, to do here is form a, a, a big picture or, or long-term investment thesis for the for the audience here. Now you can you can you can uh, decide you know that you want to do no more you want to invest in these companies you talk about or not it's entirely up to you but for us because we look at the semiconductor supply chain as a whole uh, that is why um, um, rather more often than not we actually uh, will encounter the same companies as you as you know companies do not just produce one uh, product or one uh, uh, they use only one technology right uh, good companies should diversify and that, and that is the and that is what is happening to uh, these three companies here now first I'm going to talk about MPI now I'm sure you have remembered this company which I've uh, shared in a couple of months before in the latest uh, in the webinar, all right, on industrial electronics. I talked about, I shared this slide before, uh, whereby MPI is focusing more and more on automotive. But here you can see here, they actually, they are, if you can see here, all right, uh, in fact, in since 2020 or 2019, 2018, right, they've already invested in silicon carbide technologies, all right, and that is the focus of tonight's webinar okay now um before that uh quick update on you know from we i attended the latest briefing uh by mpi all right where the ceo outlined a very a few interesting but exciting uh, outlook for the company um the the, the investment thesis of uh, this uh mpi is they are beneficiary of long-term technology drivers right uh, as I mentioned before, RF, uh, power uh, 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 modules like silicon carbide, again, uh, in application like by automotive, uh, and, and they, they continuously invest, all right, to, 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 to stay ahead of the, te of the technology uh, as well as to stay ahead of this competition. And you may think that that is that if you are the type of investor who do not like very heavy capital uh, 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 um, commitment, right? Probably this may not be the um, be the uh, type of business for you because OSEC companies like MPI they require it re they require to pour a lot of capital in hundreds of millions every single year without fail to upgrade their equipment to upgrade their facilities in order for them to produce uh, more advanced uh, 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 products uh, uh, semiconductor uh, packaging for their clients right. And recently, um, actually, I'm not going to go through this. And this is more important. Uh, the key takeaways from the briefing. Um, so the highlight here is that the management has hinted, you know, that the, the next five years is going to go through a super growth. Uh, in fact, they are targeting at least in organic growth. Huh? So this is excluding, um, you know, M and A's. Huh? Uh, this is purely on organic growth. They are they are targeting at least 1.4 billion US dollars. That's I think about. 
I guess, 6 billion or more uh, in the Malaysian ringgit. If you compare that to their current revenue of about 2 billion ringgit, that's a three times growth yeah, in five years. All right? So you can imagine um, there's a huge, uh, huge uh, plan, very ambitious. And how they, are, how they can do that, they'll go about uh, how do they expand. They are actually expanding in all, all their plants, whether it's in China, Suzhou, uh, Ipoh, Malaysia, uh, so on and so forth. In fact, in China, their capacity is already hitting <laughs> the maximum utilization, right? They are actually scouting for new land, for new factories. And not only that, now nowadays, you know this, because of US-China trade war, they've got this thing going on where China for China, US for US, right? Because these clients, they do not want to be uh, get into trouble, you know, with this uh, uh, US authority, uh, this US-China trade war, like they just don't want to be involved. Uh, so they one of the requirements is if they set up a production facility in, in this part of the world, right? How secure is it that your technology will not be copied uh, by, you know, their, their, their competitors, especially those from, from China. And that is why companies like uh, in the MPI, right? They are very smart. So they say, okay, China clients, I'll set up a plant in China. US client, I'll also set up a plant <laughs> factory in US, right? And not only that, they are actually acquiring design house. Now, remember in the, just now in the high level semiconductor, so a chip production process on the far left, right? Uh, after the, uh, after the uh, R&D, uh, we've got the design house. This is the type of uh, design house that they're acquiring. And as we know, I'll show later, they are acquiring a, a design house that's uh, specialized in uh, silicon carbide. Okay, now in terms of the segmental contribution, uh, automotive is the main contributor followed very closely by industrial electronics. Now, as you can see here, the common denominator here is both of the automotive and electron industrial uh, 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 um, these um, segments, right, are very much uh, involved in power uh, uh, management. So they, they, I'm sure that uh, MPI, uh, the, most of the products here are actually produced for power management or power modules, yeah. Okay, then the others are consumer. This is a mainly your uh, of uh, telecommunication devices, so on and so forth. They've got three big plants uh, in Malaysia and China. So Malaysia, they've got two plants, what, what, what they call the M site and S site. My thinking is that M stands for MEMS, uh, which is a sensor, a, a MEMS sensor, as well as S stands for second carbide here. All right. Now, uh, then uh, the Suzhou site is mainly for 5G testing. Okay, now, um, uh, so these are just a few snapshots from the slides, uh, which I um, snapshot for my own personal usage. So I'm just sharing with, 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 with you, you guys. So I, I quote the source here properly. Uh, as you can see here, you know, in terms of the automotive segment, they are actually uh, very much involved in the maps and sensors riding the, riding the sensorization wave. Uh, uh, they actually produce uh, these optical sensors and packaging for uh, this environmental uh, uh, sensing like pressure, gas, so on and so forth, right? But I want to, you to focus here. Actually, for their power packaging for automotive, they actually uh, have invested a lot of R&D into customized solutions for silicon carbide and gallium uh, nitrate technology. So they are actually into this many uh, few years ago already. They are not just starting out. In fact, a lot of their so, uh, technology, uh, their their solutions are already uh, available to be to be used by their clients if their clients choose to. Then, in terms of R connectivity, as I mentioned before, gallium nitrate is more suitable uh, for uh, communications. That's why uh, uh, they have. Uh, this MPI has also a lot of solution for this RF connectivity uh, using gallium nitrate. Okay, now then on the industrial segment, they've uh, actually, um, MPI is involved a lot in these data centers. Uh, as you know, data centers also require a lot of chips as well as uh, maps and sensors. Uh, as you can see here, um, um, this, uh, they've got very high value manufacturing uh, technologies for these data centers. And, and here you can see that actually they, they talk a lot about CU clip, uh, this copper clip, which I'll explain a little bit later. This is another type of packaging uh, technology. They're not using wire bondings, but instead they use uh, copper plates. Okay. Then, uh, yeah, this, this, is, this is it. Now for copper clips, right? Uh, what is so different from the typical wire bonding? Uh? So as you can see here, instead of wire bonds, actually we have this copper uh, plates. Uh, I don't know what you call it, but uh, it's called wire bond free. 
and and by placing by using this kind of design right so you know they can with they have a very low thermal resistance uh they are uh, packaging resistance you know they're called all these uh, advantages and and especially for high powered uh, industrial um, applications right actually more and more uh, uh these semiconductor players are choosing these uh, copper clips for their packaging instead of the typical wire bonds or even uh, bumpings yeah Okay, now then for the communication segment, we've got RF power packaging for base stations, which actually use a lot of GAN technology, so on and so forth. Yeah, so this is basically just to show you uh, the, the different segments that they're involved in. Okay, and last but not least, all right. Um, so this is again from the uh, from the presentation slide, right? Um, MPI is still investing a lot of money into SIC because they believe that SIC is the key to unlock future RF and power application requirements. Um, although they say that CarSan, because CarSan is a subsidiary of uh, uh, this MPI, uh, although their strategy is very much fo focused on automotive, they are very well positioned to benefit from the opportunities in the data center, the server, sorry, the server uh, communications as well as PC markets. Yeah, as you can see here, as I mentioned, so these are all the all the um, um, benefits of using this uh, uh, signal carbide as well as their capabilities. But look at but look here. Now, in terms of their capex plans, they are actually looking to acquire. So they are actively out there looking for a design house. You know, they are involved in silicon carbide technologies. This shows you how serious they are, you know, and, and, and they are such a big believer that, you know, silicon carbide is going to be more and more important, all right, uh, uh, um, moving forward. Now, in my opinion, silicon carbide and this gallium nitrate goes hand in hand, depending on the different types of applications that you, the customer wants. But I guess in, the, in terms of the packaging technologies, they are not too different. And that is why... Um, but also companies like MPI, they tend to use uh, SIC and uh, GAN packaging or, almost interchangeably, but although they are, I'm sure there are um, uh, uh, huge differences between the packaging requirements for, for these two materials. Yeah. Okay. So that's MPI. Now, next, I want to talk about this uh, a quick update on Panda Master. Um, if you recall, uh, we talked about Panda Master again early in the year as well. Uh, when we talk about, oh, the same time I talk about MPI because this is under industrial electronics, right? Whereby I focus more on the factory automation system. But Penta Master's major contributor, a revenue contributor, is still from the automatic testing equipment side, which contributes close to 70% of the revenue in 2020. Now, and in this particular segment, um, uh, one of the huge uh, uh, division is in automotive. Uh, as you can, uh, and, and the Panda Master actually uh, produces a lot of testing equipment, whether it is optical uh, vision inspection or burn-in test solutions uh, for, uh, for this automotive. And I think lately, I think this was last year, uh, October 2020, they actually announced that they have already a burn-in test solution for power devices um, that they are using uh, silicon carbide. All right, so they are, they're telling, I mean, they are ready, you know, to capture this growth already. And then they not only the burn-in test, they also have the automatic um, optical, sorry, the optical uh, vision inspection handlers, uh, which is actually suitable for packaging uh, technologies uh, like silicon carbide, CMOS, uh, flip chips, so on and so forth. So they are already geared up, you know, for the, uh, for the growth of silicon carbide. Uh, that is why Panda Master uh, is, is, is uh, I believe, is a company that we should look at if this uh, power semiconductor uh, is your investment thesis, yeah? Um, well, unfortunately, because of the pandemic, uh, as you know, uh, the pandemic has led to this um, uh, huge problem in chip shortages, especially for the automotive players. And that is why for the first half of 2021, the automotive segment is not doing well because, I mean, just recently you, you, you hear news about Ford or even GM shutting more plants because they can't uh, procure the, uh, the, uh, the automotive chips that they need. You know, there is a huge bottleneck there. And, and unfortunately, as, you, as I mentioned just now, actually the silicon carbide um, 
the main usage is actually in automotive. I guess about close to 40% of silicon carbide produced are actually being used for automotive applications. And naturally, um, um, because of that, um, uh, a lot of these semi uh, silicon carbide uh, manufacturers, they have to slow down because there's no demand, right? But we believe that this situation is going to reverse, especially in the second half of this year and moving forward uh, as, the, as the situation subsides uh, and when uh, this uh, uh, capacity is become uh, is more available now to the automotive players. So we believe there's a lot of pent up demand for these automotive players. And that is why we think, uh, we believe that the business, especially for this division, is going to come back for Penta Master. As you can know, uh, sorry, as you can see, actually the Penta Master share price has taken a beating lately. Uh, I personally believe, I personally feel that there is a great opportunity. Yeah? So they talk about this um, industry growth drivers in the latest uh, Penta Master International Investor Relations. Uh, presentation. I think you can download this from the website. Um, they talk about this China NEV aspiration. Remember, I talked about China NEV uh, in the previous couple of webinars as well. And, and, and although US is not accounting for 56% of the EVs on the road, right? Sorry, PRC is uh, uh, accounting for 56 uh, China and the US is 70%, right? This is, uh, this is only going to grow, you know? And, and in that regard, uh, SI uh, SIG based products will gain more popularity as new energy vehicles become uh, more mainstream. And that is a driving force, and that is investment thesis, you know, for, or for at least, at least uh, for this uh, Panda Master is, is, is involved. Okay. And, and uh, how time is it now? Okay, good on time. Last but not least, I'm going to talk about MI. And MI, uh, I mentioned before, um, uh, they are in semiconductor equipment as well as automation. Uh, lately, uh, this company is very, very, uh, very innovative. They are venturing into semiconductor materials as well. Uh, this happened when uh, MI Technovation acquired this Taiwanese company called Accurus, right? And we wonder you know, what is Accurus, right? Now, Accurus is, is a Taiwan-based uh, uh, company that specializes in solder balls. Okay, so they do, a, I mean, they produce a lead-free solder ball sphere with all these uh, uh, benefits, you know, and they've got also this copper cord solder balls. Uh, as you can see, if you remember, uh, what are the uses of this? If you go back to the previous slides, oh, sorry about that. Okay, now copper balls are used here, no? Space, they are used as spacer balls in between um, these, uh, 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 these different dies in a uh, uh, package here, okay? Now, so am I, um, by acquiring accurate, they are venturing into the semiconductor material space already. Now, um, I actually have very high respects for the founder, Mr. Orr, because I feel that a lot of his um, actions uh, recently, uh, although may not excite the market a lot, but I do agree with why he's doing things this way because he's looking at long-term business. And I think he see that uh, in terms of the ATE or equipment business, it's very red sea already. Um, locally, he has to compete with all these uh, players, you know, like Penta Master or even the emerging smaller uh, uh, equipment players like QES or you've got to fight with price. Right? So he said, hey, I don't know, fight with these guys. Yeah, yeah. yeah. Uh, equipment is uh, automation is still going to be my core business, but I also want to, to venture into you know a, 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 a bluer ocean, right? And that is why he come up with this thing called SMBU. Now uh, he has SEBU Sabu for semiconductor equipment business unit, Arbu for automation and robotics. Now he has SMBU also <laughs> called semiconductor materials and chemicals business unit. Now remember in the earlier uh, uh, part of this webinar, I talked about that you know I, I say that. Semiconductor materials can roughly be categorized in two groups, one for the fabrication processes and one for the, uh, the other for the packaging, right? And also I show you that most of the semiconductor material suppliers are mainly chemical companies. And you, as you can see here, this is what he's trying to do. Now, um, this is the business uh, model of uh, MIT Innovation previously, all right? Now he's adding another arm, uh, uh, for these semiconductor materials and chemicals. And he is gonna target uh, wafer fat as well as the packaging applications. So you can see how 
uh, how far this Mr. O is, is looking and how far he's going to bring MI. La, all right. Um, um, uh, then, of course, uh, he, because of this, then Acuras has, uh, I think, a couple of production plants in Taiwan as well as in China. Okay. So now, uh, and what, what, what is the benefit of this Acuras technology? Now, in terms of the um, technology, uh, Acuras uh, has a new way of you know, uh, producing these balls. Uh. Now, as, as, as you can see here, uh, based on their own, so I'm not expert here, but basically this is from their present, uh, investor presentation. Um, traditionally, how soda balls are being produced are using punching metals processes or wire cutting. But for Acuras, they are using a fully electronic method, you know, whereby they use chemicals as well as uh, electronic uh, uh, processes to actually uh, produce the uh, solder balls. And that is why they claim uh, they can produce very fine solder balls, uh, which, are being, which are being used for the more advanced packaging uh, technologies, which I shown you earlier on the slide from KL Air 10 Core. Now, apart from that, um, this company has all the required certification from uh, this uh, SGS, which is like the serum of German, uh, sorry, from, from Germany. So um, they are, which means that they are, their products are widely accepted lah, by global uh, uh, clients as well as global standards. Now, as you can see here, uh, soda balls are getting more and uh, smaller and smaller and smaller, right? Uh, I think from this picture, we can't really see it, but you get the point. Okay, now, not only that, now I believe that Mr. O is quite smart in a way that, you know, when he acquired Acuras, so sorry, when MI Technovation acquired Acuras as a company, right, they also acquired Acuras's clientele, <laughs> right? So although Acuras operates from China, so naturally they've got a lot of China, uh, uh, these are clients uh, from big names like Mcore, Utech, uh, Chipmoss, uh, SPIL, TSMC, Kingston, Statchips, Pack, so ASE, so on and so forth, right? So he's trying to tap into this, uh, into this uh, um, um, uh, clientele as well. And also Acuras Scientific has a lot of global clientele as, name, uh, as uh, presented here. All right. Now these are all from the Acuras website. I didn't. This is not insider information. Basically, I just uh, package it and make it nicer looking for the purpose of this presentation. Okay. But uh, what I want you to see is actually is quite uh, why what, what is the what is the mindset behind uh, the founder when he acquired Acuras. All right. As you can see, traditionally, MI Technovation is a uh, produce uh, sorry is equipment manufacturer for semiconductor as well as automation and you know this is actually not an easy business to be in in fact you are trying to compete with very well-known names uh, from us from 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 the european countries right and and people when you when mi approach uh prospects or clients right they say hey, who are you you know although although they are very innovative no doubt but still as most clients may prefer older names or more trusted names, all right? Now, with the acquisition of Acuras, right? Uh, you know, and you, they know that Acuras supply, say, soda balls to these clients, right? Actually, they can cross-sell a lot of the other products um, to these existing uh, clients of Acuras. I think and that's a pretty smart move. Although you may say that, oh, success rate is another story. Yes, but at least now they are, able to tap into the, uh, uh, this uh, uh, a wider uh, chain of our clientele. And, and I believe that this is not the end game for MI Technovation. In fact, in the latest AGM, uh, the management has already hinted that actually they are still on the M&A trail. They are still trying, looking to acquire uh, uh, companies, uh, you know, to complete <laughs> the, uh, the uh, um, uh, suit of services and products that they can offer to their clients. Basically, uh, MI wants to be the one-stop shop, you know, for all the uh, big names are in the semiconductor world. Okay, so I guess that's it for tonight. What I'm going to share, um, maybe just recap, you know, Semiconductor materials, although not visible to, to the eye, especially in the end product, right? They are absolutely important. Uh, in fact, so much so that uh, they can, the shortages of semiconductor materials like substrates uh, can cause a, a huge a dent or a breakdown of the semiconductor, sorry, 
of the semiconductor supply chain globally, right? And uh, uh, because of these uh, incidents, companies like NVIDIA, um, AMD, Intel, they, they realize the risks, uh, they realize this weakest link. That's why they're investing on their own uh, to have their own uh, semiconductor materials uh, 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 supply um, to, in order for them to, to secure so that you know, there's no more disruption like what they have faced uh, uh, during the pandemic time. And, and in that regard, um, there are not many companies in Malaysia that, uh, that has the, you know, the eyesight to actually venture into this space as well. And thankfully, we have companies like M MPI, uh, Panda Master, MIT Innovation. They are already taking steps you know, to secure a future, to secure the relevance in the semiconductor um, um, supply chain. So I'm sure that these companies are going to do very well, although they are cyclical. Now, of course, I only talk, talk about the good points uh, in my webinar, and that's the nature of you know, case studies, right? Uh, don't forget there are also inherent risks when you invest in these type of companies as well. And as you know, semiconductor um, companies are very susceptible to interest rates uh, because their valuation of these companies are very sensitive to the interest rate environment. Okay, so with that, I end my presentation tonight. I hope it's not too dry. I hope it's not too technical and I hope you enjoy it. So Shane, over to you for Q&A. Thank you so much, David, for a very, very insightful session. Huh? Okay, so I think all of us here, we have learned a lot more about the semiconductor materials, uh, particularly silicon carbide and also uh, gallium nitride. Right, so if you have any question to ask David in regards to this session, uh, to this topic, please write in the Q and A box, uh, so we'll be able to address them. Of course, due to time constraint, we may not able might not be able to address all questions. So apologize if we uh, cannot un we are unable to you know hit until your question, right? So, so we uh, have to open the Q and A, right? Yeah. So Kai Xuan like to ask, you no know, tech giants are planning to make their own chip. How would this affect local semiconductor company? Ah, okay, great question. Um, I believe that, you know, um, uh, I, I think Kaishan, you're referring to companies like Amazon, um, Alibaba, Tencent, right? Uh, where they produce their own, their own chips for their specific application. Now, um, I think what they're trying to say is um, they are, want to involve in the design processes all the way to the end product. But I'm sure that along the way, they won't be able to do everything in-house right? because... To do that, number one, you have to import a lot of talent as well as technology. And I don't think uh, they can do it um, from scratch and to be able to compete, you know. Just like, you know, just think about TSMC. There are a lot of companies, there are a lot of found founders that are trying to compete with TSMC, but TSMC is so far ahead of the competition and in terms of the technology dominance, right? That you know, might as well just outsource to them you know, to produce the wafers just other than doing it on your own. And, um, but of course, there are other reasons, other angles to look at, not just in terms of technology advancement. There are also national security, which is getting more and more um, popular to be used as a reason. All right. Um, and that is why go, uh, companies like go, Global Foundries, they are doing it on, on their own. But coming back to your question, um, I do not believe that these tech giants are going to do all the, all the processes uh, by themselves. Now, uh, although I simplify a lot of the things that I share, especially in the production process uh, of, uh, of the um, semiconductor chips, right? Actually, each process is very unique, very specific, and very long. It can take up to three to four months during normal times uh, before the chip uh, short shortages uh, for the um, semiconductor to be uh, from the wafer uh, all the way to the end product as when I say end product, I'm talking about the packaging chips. Okay, so I believe that instead of a threat, all right, this is this is actually opportunities for companies like the all set players to actually, you know, expand their clientele. All right, I may be wrong, but uh, I think logically and quite uh, speaking, if I'm a businessman, all right, I'll be outsourcing certain parts of the processes. Okay, uh, the next question is by Harry Martin. The chips production involves a number of processes. Are these chips being transported to one factory from another factory along the process to complete all the processes, which also means from another company <laughs> to another company? Definitely. And not just 
transfer from one factory to one factory. In fact, they are transferred from one country to another country, uh, normally by air cargo or by uh, shipping uh, ships. If that is definitely true. And uh, just think about it. Um, just look at your Apple. You know, uh, I think Apple iPhone 13 is being announced, right? This is the latest hype, right? And they're focusing a lot on this um, this uh, uh, camera. Now, the camera, this uh, a flashlight or even the camera module, right? The design could come from US or European countries, the design, right? The wafer fabrication can come from US uh, or even uh, UK, uh, Europe or even uh, Taiwanese companies, right? Then after that, after the wafer is produced, the wafer is being shipped to say Singapore or Malaysia or the other countries, right? To be processed further, to be diced, to be cut, to be packaged into the LED uh, package that we can see. Then the final product, and that's not even the final product. The product will be shipped back to say Taiwan, you know, Foxconn, where they will assemble, that's where the EMS is, right? Will assemble the, the module into the phone. Right, so in the process, as I mentioned before, the process can take months or weeks to months, and they can travel from one continent to another continent. Definitely. Mm, okay, um, David, uh, this question is by Abdul Az Abdul Azia. So, Abdul can you shed some light about the profit margin uh, for these semiconductor materials? Ah, okay, semiconductor materials. Definitely, the margins depending. Uh, um, uh, I do not have. I have I do not I have not made enough study into this in depth, so I cannot comment. But uh, uh but I can say that um depending on the materials that you're looking at, all right. Now, for example, soda balls are not very high tech, all right. Okay, wait, I mean as compared to other semiconductor materials, right? Especially in the fabrication process, all right. Um, so the margin should not be very high, but they comp they are compensated by volume. All right, because as you as I mentioned before, we need a lot, a lot, a lot of these soda balls, very tiny one, as small as ten microns, right, to be used in the packaging. Now, on the other hand, we have, uh, as I mentioned, uh, as I shared in this webinar, right, uh, packaging requirements for silicon carbide and gallium nitrate, whereby it is this because of the nature of these materials, which are tougher, you know, they resist chemical and uh, 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 this um, uh, thermal and mechanical wear and tear, which also means that it's very hard to, 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 to produce them, to etch them, to dice them, to package them, right? So because of these uh, very high or very specific unit requirements, I believe um, for that kind of uh, uh, business uh, uh, that involves silicon carbide and gallium nitrate as well as other advanced compounds in the future, right? They should command higher margins, yeah? Um, although every time we ask the management during AGMs or during briefings, right, they will say this is trade secret, so they won't, they won't, they won't let us know what are the margins, but they will give us a blended margin of the overall uh, uh, business unit. Yeah, so hmm. that's all I know. <laughs> okay. Uh, the next question is by. Um, uh, There's a there. question by Pang Alam. About Sutera. Yeah, it's a very interesting question, right? All right, then let, let's yeah, so ask how you do you see question, Sutera no? Malaysia in the field of chips industry, right? Now, a lot of people underestimate, like, or for the lack of a better word, look down on Sutera. Um, because the techno of course, if you compare Sutera to giants like Foxconn, right? Uh, yeah, heaven and earth, right? But Sutera has its um, niche market. I mentioned just now in one of the slides that power semiconductors do not require very advanced nodes that do not require even 10, 20 nanometers. Even 150, 180, 200 millimeters, right? Is enough to produce, uh, is, is, is enough to actually manufacture these power semiconductors. And I believe this is where Sutera is still very relevant. And the fact that Foxconn um, is... Um, buying a stake in uh, Sutera, right? I think as much as, I think it was 5% or 10%, all right? Shows you that actually, um, uh, I believe the reason why they do want to do that is because they want to have additional capacity out of the Taiwan, right? And they, will, they, will, they, they want to look for a, a company that is cheap, but at least has the capability or the know-how to do it. So I believe um, um, Sutera is still very relevant. In fact, uh, 
without going into too much details, I, I personally am looking forward to what Sutera has to offer, especially with this new strategic investor from Foxconn. Mm. Mm. Okay. Understand. So uh, would you be able to share like what are some companies, local companies that supply to Cree? <laughs> uh, I thought it was I thought I was quite obvious already. <laughs> MPI surprise to Cree, that's one. Yeah, and previously, I think from our research, um, there was a, I think Unisam was also trying to eye for a cake, a piece of the cake, uh, but I'm not sure whether they are successful or not. Mm. Yeah. Okay. Um, so does uh, Penta Master supply the Cree? Oh, that one they'll never review. <laughs> they never review, huh? They'll so... never review. Yeah, but just think about it, lah. If if they're not if you're not supplying today, I am sure somewhere down the road they should. I mean, depending on their luck as well as how, in in this very tough time, it's very a bit tough because you cannot visit the customer site, right? Or you can't even ship your engineers, you know, to the customer site to do demos, right? Uh, but if they are not su supplying to them now which I'll be very surprised. Uh, I'm sure somewhere down the road, they should be able to tap into their uh, circle. Because as I mentioned, right, key, uh, Cree commands 60% of the market, right? Uh, I believe that uh, there should be some opportunity there. Now, don't forget the other 40% as well. And in that 40%, there are a lot of um, Chinese players uh, like uh, Epi World, uh, SICC, uh, uh, even these European companies I'm sorry um, suddenly I just cannot remember the names yeah but I remember the Chinese companies uh, even BYD you know uh, the famous company that uh, uh, um, Warren Buffett invests in and the reason is because you know China when they are in their 14th national uh, uh, China 14th uh, plan right they are actually focusing a lot on third generation uh, semiconductors, which, which includes these uh, white band gap semiconductors I mentioned, right? And that is why uh, they are very serious in it. So I'm sure that Panda Master having presence in China, uh, Hong, I mean, listed in Hong Kong and China as well, right? I'm sure if not Cree, they should be able to tap into the other uh, um, um, uh, clientele. Mm, okay. Uh, Jude Seung would like to ask, what is your perspective on UWC uh, who is going to be involved in 5G and EV chip testing? Um, to be honest, uh, so, so what, what is the name of the uh, person who asked the question? Chiu Seung, is it? Jude Seung. Jude Seung, uh, I'm very sorry. I do not know enough about UWC to answer that. Um, so you can tell that I'm not invested in UWC at all. So uh, hopefully in the next coming sessions, I will have done my homework, all right? But for now, I'm sorry, I cannot answer that because I really don't know. Okay. Mm -hmm. uh, Wei Xiang would like to ask, what is your opinion on DRAM and NAND, uh, N-A-N-D and also D-R-A-M? Recently, mm -hmm. there is an analyst in the street said that the cycle for both DRAM and uh, NAND had uh, ended. If yes, does it affect Malaysia semiconductor companies? Mm, well, again, depends on your application. If you say ender, I think that's a bit um, eccentric or absolute. Uh, I'm sure there are still a lot of consumer devices uh, um, um, that will still use NAND and DRAM, all right? Uh, the older devices, the older techs. But if you're talking about new technologies, especially in the EV space, like, yeah, I tend to agree with you that maybe NAND and DRAM, uh, DRAM will not be, again, will not be, um, the, 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 the relevance will not be as much as uh, other technologies. You see, just like silicon, that's why early in the part of this webinar, I, I, I need to lay out the, 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 a, a realistic view, right? Uh, when we talk about, when we talk a lot about SIG, uh, silicon carbide, uh, gallium nitrate in the future maybe all about uh, about even more uh, advanced materials right it doesn't mean that silicon has reached the end of the road no no silicon is still very much relevant all right um, um, when it comes to uh, semiconductor as well as uh, all these uh, uh, packaging uh, uh, and technologies but 
they may not be as useful for uh, new technologies uh, like what I mentioned. The same thing will go for the memory chips, uh, sorry, for, for the types of memories that he mentioned. I believe that a lot of consumer devices will still rely on a lot of NAND and DRAM, although in the future, it, they may eventually phase it out. I don't know because in somewhere down the road, who knows, they may, be, they may come a, 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 a blockbuster uh, a memory uh, technology that will replace a lot of these uh, 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 existing ones. Yeah. Mm, okay. So are the barriers of entry to solder ball higher? No, barrier entry for solder balls are not high. In fact, there are so many companies that are doing this. Uh, Kapling, uh, just Google, just, just Google soda balls. <laughs> yeah, so many names. But they do um, cater, different companies cater for different industries, cater to different clientels. Uh. I'm sure the American companies, uh, as I mentioned, as I, as I, let me show you here. Now, you see, now, although, you know, um, you see, this is the market, uh, global soda fields market share. Um, the the biggest market is sorry the biggest producer is actually Sanju from Japan. Then we got other companies here, uh, and there are also a lot of others here uh, which are not mentioned. Uh, all right. Um. Uh, but by the way, uh, this is didn't come from me. This is actually coming from Acura. So I'm not sure how updated they are. Uh, I'm very surprised that there, there are no other names, especially from the Western side. But maybe they command. Uh, they make up a very small percentage. Uh. But the major top three players are Senju from Japan, Acura from Taiwan, and uh, MKE from Korea. And these are not high barrier entry. Now, the high barrier entry business uh, for semiconductor materials is in the substrate. That one is very high barrier entry. And it requires a lot of technology, uh, sorry, a lot of R&D, and uh, a, lot of, uh, a lot of years of research uh, to be able to produce a good substrate. And right now, the dominant technology is actually uh, by an Ajinomoto, which is what we call the ABF. Now, in my personal opinion, although I do not have uh, the hard facts to support my hypothesis, I believe that the current situation of the substrate uh, shortages right, has opened up opportunities uh, for more, more uh, uh, for alternatives to become to come online because I'm sure that all these semiconductor players have uh, uh, producers who do not want to be rely on one single uh, uh, technology for the substrate. I'm sure somewhere down the road they are going to come. Uh, they will appear. There is there's going to be a uh, new new substrates uh, materials coming on. Yeah. Mm, okay. Thank you so much, David, for the very robust Q and A sessions. So uh -huh. uh, time is running out. So we uh have to, have to end the Q and A here. Yeah, I, I have to apologize. Uh, I I saw a couple of questions regarding price. I cannot comment about price. I can only talk to you about the business, about what they do, about the prospect, you know. But I cannot absolutely comment about the valuation or the stock price. I hope you understand. Yeah. Yeah, thank that's you, why Shane. we never pick those questions. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> thank you. Because none of us are licensed investment advisor. I just remember. Okay, so thank you very much, David, for doing this uh, semiconductor material sessions beyond the silicon. So today we have learned a great deal about silicon carbide and also gallium nitride. So hope that you all have a really uh, valuable sessions joining tonight's sessions. Thank you for having me. So uh, let me tell you more about our next webinar. All right, for our next webinar, which will happen on next Friday, the, the topic will be on Fibonacci analysis for trading. So it's happening on 24th of February, 2021, 8.30 to 10 o'clock. So I've given you the, the, the enrollment link, registration link in the chat group. So you may go there and register uh, right away to, if you want to learn more about how to use Fibonacci analysis in trading, right? So, yes, uh, thank you, David, for coming to this session. And thank you, everybody. For Thanks again, Shane and Busan Malaysia. Thank you. Yeah. Stay safe, everyone. Stay safe, everyone. And mm. thanks for showing up until the very end of this webinar. So see you all again next Friday. Okay, have a great rest of the day. Bye-bye. Good evening. Bye-bye.